Isaiah chapter 42. Begin at verse. Begin at verse 13. So the Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, war. He shall prevail against his enemies. I have long time holding my peace. I have been still and refrained myself. Now when I cry like a traveling woman, a woman in process of giving birth, I will destroy and devour at once. I will make waste mountains and hills and dry up all their herbs. I will make the rivers islands and I will dry up the pools. I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. Now here Elohim speaks about the gathering of his people of Israel and make it known to his people that he loved his people. He will be jealous for his people. For the Gentiles have deceived and misled and have persecuted his people and he will be jealous for his people and have even turned away many his people from him. He will be jealous. Verse 16 says, I will bring them I will bring the blind by the way that they knew not. There is something that many people do not perceive. Oftentimes in the scripture when it appears that many say it's speaking about Christ, sometimes it speaks about Christ and it's speaking about Elijah. The spirit of Elijah is Melchizedek. Sometimes it speaks about it's speaking about Elijah when people think it's talking about the Messiah. Because they don't do not acknowledge Melchizedek today. Most people do not acknowledge the reality of another eternal son of God, as spoken of in the seventh chapter of Hebrews. Especially among many European Gentiles. I read one some time ago from a Drake Bible, Drake, I think he's, he's pronouncing. Implied when it says Melchizedek had neither beginning of days nor end of life, mother nor father just say they didn't know his days. Mother, father say just didn't know his mom and daddy, and say he was a Canaanitish priest or Canaanitish king or ruler, denying the scripture because it wasn't something that his man could deal with. But he was educated, and he translated some people just follow these theologians, and the ignorance of them is is astounding. Rather than follow the Holy Spirit, many of God's people don't have faith in the Holy Spirit. So they follow theologians' commentaries and theologians' writings. But either way, he denied Melchizedek as was described, as is described in the seventh chapter of Hebrews. Neither beginning of days nor in of life, but made like unto the supreme Son of God, uh, like unto Yahshua or Jesus. Couldn't take it. Many people can't take the day when they read that of Melchizedek. They say, well, this must be Jesus because he's eternal and he has all this power. He is the enforcer of righteousness and peace in the kingdom of heaven. And they can't accept it. The priests of the Most High God, of God the Father, Elohim, the Most High, they can't deal with it. So we'll say, well, this must be Jesus. Jesus has not always been a man. Melchizedek is an eternal spirit man. To say that Melchizedek was Jesus is to bring Jesus down below Jesus. Jesus didn't become a man until he took on him the seed of Abraham and got his out of Abraham's sperms that God the Father had taken from Abraham. He got his out of that sperm of Abraham 2,000 years ago, more or less. And the Holy Ghost brought that sperm down, which the Son of God had gotten inside of the sperm of Abraham, the Father taken of him. 
The Holy Ghost brought it down and inseminated inside of Mary, a virgin named Mary. She conceived that sperm with the Supreme Spirit, Son of God, inside of it. God is God's Son of the Spirit. In case you don't know that. Then God inside one of Abraham's sperm. Mary conceived that sperm. The Holy Ghost inseminated inside of her. She, she conceived it in her reproductive cell. And it developed of her body nourishing that sperm. The vessel, the avatar of the supreme son of God, the word of God. He got inside of Abraham's seed, one of Abraham's sperm as his avatar. Came to earth in it. The Holy Ghost brought him down inside of it. His body, a sperm body. The Holy Ghost put it inside of Mary, and Mary conceived it in her reproductive cell. Went through the natural function of developing inside of her womb as you did in your mother's womb. Nourished of her body. You were. Christ's body was. The Spirit, Son of God, inside of it. Some people can't even hear me. Spirit inside of a sperm. Some of them, are you saying to you just finished? Somebody asked the question, are you saying Joseph got pregnant? No, no, I didn't say nothing about Joseph. If you didn't hear me, I just terrified the head of him. The Supreme Spirit, Son of God, inside of that sperm, that Mary conceived that the Holy Ghost had inseminated inside of her. Go through that whole something down there, some fool say, are you, ain't you saying this? You just can't hear me. You just had an ear to hear. They didn't hear. Those that can't hear, we hear them no one. Because you can't believe it. Took on that flesh, that sperm in a way, and it developed into flesh in Mary's womb. Mary birthed Emmanuel. God in human flesh. God with us as one of us. For as much as the children of a of flesh and blood, he likewise took part of the S A M E. Genealogically. S A M E. Same. Tip all points like we are inside the same S A M E. Flesh and blood as we are of. Descended of Adam. Him through Abraham and of Mary. The great, great, great granddaughter of King David. In that lineage. Um, that's a part of the book of St. Luke. That's accountable to Mary's genealogy. His stepfather, stepfather, Mary's husband, was Joseph. Christ took on him the seed that he was birthed of man. Came to redeem mankind. To save men from their sins. Let me go back to Isaiah chapter 42. We need to know the truth of the gospel. So much that needs to be understood that people don't understand. In Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 15, God said, I will make waste mountains. We go as I was explaining. Many people do not acknowledge sons of God more than one. Christ, Melchizedek, they deny his existence. They deny the son of God. Most people even don't even accept that God has a son. That the father really begot a son. And most people, as I said, never even consider the word begot in St. John 3.16. They don't even know they don't consider it. If the father begot him, that means somebody else birthed him. That means you know, where so your daddy begot you, then somebody else birthed you. And you, you do not hear it said that your mama begot you. Nor do you hear it said that your daddy birthed you. Just in case that sounds hard, complicated, or confusing. If you read the scripture, said God the Father begot the Supreme Son, that means he's saying somebody else birthed him. If that's what he's saying. So Elohim, the Holy Ghost, birthed the Supreme Son of God. 
Just like the Elohim, the Holy Ghost birthed children today, begetting the Father, begetting through the Son. Melchizedek is another eternal Son of God. All of the sons of God, even the eternal sons of God who were before this world was are uh of -oh, the Messiah, King Yahshua. We know him as now. Yahshua. Yah Savior. All of the sons of God are of him, for him, and by him. Grand is not a biblical term. The scripture uses the word branches. The Father begat a Son, a Supreme Son, through which all of the sons were born, birthed by the Holy Ghost. Elohim, the Holy Ghost, as it is with us today. You need to understand these basic things. The Messiah explained spirit birth in St. John chapter 3. When he said, you must be born of the water and of the spirit. He said, then you hear the wind blowing you off of which it cometh and whither it goeth. So is he that is born of the spirit. In that statement, he was explaining that the Holy Ghost comes as a rushing wind, as described as the occurrence in the Acts chapter 2. The Holy Ghost came as a rushing sound as of a mighty wind. Jesus said, you hear the sound of the wind going up, which it comes, the wind we go. You hear the wind coming, you say it's coming out of the east, but you don't know where it's coming from. Just because you know direction don't mean you know where it's coming from. Because you know direction it's going, don't mean you know where it's going. You don't know where it's coming, the wither it goes. So is he that's born the spirit. The Bible says on the day of Pentecost they heard a sound as a rushing mighty wind coming from heaven. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. As the Holy Spirit came in and they heard it. It filled the house where they were. And when it filled the house, overflowed in the house, it filled them. They were overflowed from within and from without. As the Spirit filled the room. In other words, he was baptizing them. You need to understand the Holy Spirit baptizes. Before he put a seed child himself in them, he overflowed them. See, in water baptism, you submerge, you go down under, and then you are raised up out. You are submerged in water. But in spirit baptism, the spirit overflows. The spirit overflowed them from without and within. And he left inside of them a seed child of himself. They were born of the Holy Ghost. Born of Christ. Begotten unto the Father. A seed child of Elohim dwells in every born again believer. You actually birthed it into the family of Elohim. This is the way the Holy Ghost gives birth. The Christ said, the wind blowing off from which it comes or whither it goeth, so is he that is born of the Spirit. And many people have a problem with that because they don't understand. But see, you need to understand this also. He was explaining that, like in natural birth, a woman conceives seed of a man. And she carries it the seed conceived the baby for about nine months before she birthed him. Uh, animals, as they say, a puppy or a cat, they conceive seed. The male, the female conceives of the male and cares for about three months and then births. With fish, the female conceives of the male and then Lays eggs, hatches eggs, lays eggs. With fowls, the female conceives of the male. And then the female lays an egg and then 
We're going to lay the hatches, the egg. But there's a female in between. And there's a time period. Without him, the Holy Ghost, it's not the same. When he, the Holy Ghost, comes, Christ was purifying, so you hear the sound of wind, or what you come to where he goes. It's an instantaneous thing. That was born of flesh is flesh. That was born of spirit is spirit. This is explained in the scripture. The Holy Ghost comes, overflows from with, without and within. And he had birthed a seed child himself inside of us. The Holy Ghost was committed unto Christ. United with him. He was anointed with the Holy Ghost. That's when he was christened as the Christ. Christ means christened or anointed. When the Holy Ghost overflows from without and within baptizing, something most people don't understand and know what that is means what it's talking about. He leaves a seed child of himself inside. In births and leaves a seed child of himself inside. Person literally born of the Holy Ghost. This is an actual occurrence. Some time ago when I was in a Bible study with a group of ministers. I I was offered to be the head of the Bible study the the uh, Conduct of the Bible study, ask question or lead in the Bible study. And I presented the question to these group of ministers Baptist, full gospel, Pentecostal, and other denominations were there. And I presented the question is being born of the Holy Ghost an actual birth? And every one of them said no. Because they did not understand St. John chapter 3 and verse 8 and realizing Acts chapter 2, a little birth. You look back and see how many ministers you've heard explain the little birth. The Holy Ghost overflows from within and without and leaves a, and then birth a seed child within the individual, the actual birth. Every one of them said no. They're ministers of the city. Most of us, some of them are still members of this city. Some may stay like, no, that won't be until Christ come back. Won't be you actually born of the Spirit. And I'm like, wow. Then I begin to explain the literal birthing of the Spirit. They were like, oh, well, you sh you should ask it like that, so they can understand. And then they learn something. So a lot of things that it's not understood. But if you listen to the Spirit, He will tell you. If you have faith in the Spirit to hear Him, He will lead and guide to all truth. A lot of people say of me, He know too much. He think He know everything because I listen to the Spirit and I follow their commentary, their theology, but I listen to the Spirit and study the Word of God. I was told of the Spirit and of the Scriptures. Through Christ, that the Holy Ghost will lead God in all truth. So I believe him, and I look for him to teach me. If it offends people for me to know things that others don't know, that's their problem. They don't bend their knees enough. They don't fast and pray enough. I recall when I first started experiencing and fasting for periods of time, I experienced that uh, first time I was. My health was so low, I was sick for about six years before I could function good. And in society, just have clearness of functioning. The second time, I fast for a long period of time, it took about 10 years. If you think things come without a price, if you think I understand, I understand without a price, you're mistaken. Jesus said, this can go not out but by prayer and fast. You think you're just going to stand up and be able to do all the things that he's speaking of? Without, you think the apostles didn't spend time in prayer and fasting? It takes a lot of time in prayer, a lot of time in study. In the study, sometimes I've seen the sun go down and I've seen it come back up while I was still sitting there studying the word of God. It takes time in study. It takes time and fasting and praying and seeking God. 
You may be offended. Some people may be offended by monogamy, but there's a price that comes. You follow God's instruction. He's appointed you to. He will direct you. The second time I was about 10 years sick and I, before I regained strength, I remember God bringing this scripture to me in Isaiah chapter 42. It says, Hear ye deaf and look ye blind that ye may see. And it says, Who is blind as my servant and deaf as my messenger that I sent? Who is blind as he that is perfect and blind as a Lord's servant? Seeing many things, but thou observest not. Open the ears, but he hears not. He revealed this to me, and that's talking about me and the spirit of Elijah being in me. In the spirit of Elijah's Melchizedek, when I was in the process of trying to recover from the time period when I was sick for 10 years, weak in my body. I was so pitifully weak, I could pick up a rock and throw it. It felt like every muscle in my body broke down. It took years to recover. But during that time, I was continually receiving revelation. I received more revelation in the, the recovery time than I did in the time when I was fasting. And then when, I, when he brought this scripture to me, I was like, God, why are you saying these things about me? I, I couldn't think. I recall sometime I was ministering, and uh, these revelations kept coming. I was teaching. And I would record, and I was ministering on radio station, KJIW, KCLT, other radio station, Plotsdale, WWN. I remember that I was sometime take the recording home and sit down and try to listen to it to just soak it in myself when I was given to minister that day. And I could begin listening to it in the first part of that listening about five minutes of it. When we get to about the next part to go to I couldn't remember what the first five I spoke that my health was so low. When I got tired, I got tighter and tighter and tighter. You know, some people you get tired, you sit down and rest. And then you get you know rested. Well, I sat down and rest, and I got tired and tired and tired. A lot of things that Elohim had to teach me, and I was learned. I remember as my head began to fail, and I said to God, pray to God to heal me. And God said, he said, you think I'll heal you because you got sick and fat. And he said, but I ain't. So rather, I'm going to teach you humility in the sickness. In the sickness, he began to tell me the spirit of Elijah in me. Elijah smelled chest there, began to give me revelations in the scripture, deep revelations. Revelation concerning the restoration of Israel and all of those things in the time of the weakness of my body. It made me humble as I received those high things that were told to me. But his will was being done, and I realized the scripture where it was saying, My servant, he heard it, but he he opened the ear, but he hearing not, and I'm like, I'm trying to hear in the time of the weakness. But anyway, verse 2 it said, The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. I want to say this concerning this that today we're not under the Ten Commandments and the laws anymore. Christ removed that in his death. When he died in the place of Israel, all mankind dying, the law died. When the bride of God died, as Paul explained back in, explained over in Romans chapter 7, when Israel the bride died, then the law died. He gave an example as if a man dies, then his wife is free to marry. Then he turned around, he actually did it in reverse, because if he said if a man dies, you know, say if a woman take another, if a man take another wife while she, while he's married, then that wouldn't have been true. Because men married more than one woman back then in, in Israel. And that, but so he turned her the other way and said, if a woman marries another man. But yet he came to the conclusion of saying that you become dead to law by the body of Christ to clarify that when Israel died in Christ's substitution, then the law died because the Ten Commandment laws were the marriage covenant. 
whereby God married Israel, and Israel married God. They united it as one. So when God gave his son to die in the place of Israel and all mankind died, then the law was dead, the marriage covenant was dead. If you die, you marry a man, and you die, or your wife died, then the marriage comes in at the death of your wife. Come. The covenant is until death do part. Same thing is with the law. That's what's explained in Romans chapter 7, verse 1 through 4. When the law is made on man, laws are living, but when man is dead, not the law. Man can't die on the cross over 2,000 years ago, more or less, one pass on the day. Christ substituted died for man, therefore all mankind was dead. The one that and we thus judge the apostle Roman Corinthians, that if one died for all dead were all dead. So since man was dead, Israel and all mankind was dead, dead, then the marriage covenant whereby Israel married God's father was dead because Israel was dead. So therefore he said, Now you have become dead to law by the body of Christ, Christ Christ's body dead substituted for man dying. So now you dead to law by the body of Christ, and now that you may be married to another, instead of being married to God the Father, saying unto Israel and to all mankind, now you can marry God the Son, who is risen from the dead, to give the clarity. But he had to go through this explain about one dying of the marriage. We're not under law anymore, but now we are to marry Christ. See the the Bible is composed of two testaments, will and testaments. The old testament were animals of God the Father giving them. The new, the testament is the Supreme Spirit, Son of God, who took on the seed of Abraham. Even though we're not under the law of Moses, yet the law teaches the righteousness of the Holy Ghost. The Ten Commandments of the Laws were, was a foreshadowing of the righteousness of the Holy Spirit that was to come and be inverted inside of man. It was only a foreshadow. It was not the very image of the righteousness of the Holy Ghost or the righteousness of Christ or the Father, but it was a shadow. It only showed of the righteousness of the Holy Ghost. You see, it is one thing to learn God's righteous standards and laws and rules and regulations. But it's another thing for God himself to come to you and be inverted inside of you and teach you and instruct you and empower you. This is an astounding thing. This is why Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, so the law had no glory. He called the administration of death because it was condemnation. That's the purpose that was given for the condemned, as he explained in Galatians. The administration of death, it had no glory. When you compare it to the administration of the Spirit, Christ inverted inside of you, the Holy Ghost inverted inside of you, the very nature of God, the law of his nature, his Torah, in spirit form, his law in spirit form, God's own nature inverted inside of us. Not only instructing us in righteousness, using the law, using the knowledge of good and evil, using your life experiences, yet you're not under it. Using all these things, someone else is telling you the form of your things, to teach you, to instruct you, as he from within you also give you the power to do everything that he instructs you to do. See, this is far greater. Paul said when you compare the law to the spirit, the law didn't even have no glory, even though Moses' face shined when he came down from the mountaintop. But yet, there's righteousness in the law. So you have to understand this. Just because the Holy Spirit will show you God's righteousness, let me explain something. Some of his righteous standards, right, righteous ways. Now, you have the Ten Commandments, and then you have a law.
The Ten Commandments is like the Constitution. The law that is written in the book will like the laws of the land. You see, you can read in the Ten Commandments, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But you will go to the law to explain to you how to keep it holy. You don't walk over a certain disc, you don't pick up sticks on the Sabbath day, so you said that was in the book of the law. The Ten Commandments was a basic standard outlay. It's like you go to the Constitution of the United States of America. The Constitution is one thing. Better make laws in accordance with the Constitution. The laws are supposed to be like a branch from the Constitution. In, this, in the Word of God, the law God gave, the Ten Commandments God gave, it is this righteous. The law is righteous, just, and holy and good. The problem was in the law that they were bad at anything. The problem was in man. And the law was too weak to give man the power to live right, even though it could show man in the wrong. So there's much to learn. The Spirit will teach from the law, show you things. Don't think it's strange. That don't mean you're under it. You got a better covenant. And a greater covenant. And actually, you're required to surpass the law. You, you need to understand this. You ought to fulfill the righteousness that is in the law. And even go beyond. Jesus said in one place, You were instead of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. Right? That's a, one of the commandments in the law. He said, But I say to you, whosoever looked to lust after a woman has already committed adultery in his heart. His judgment, that's beyond the law, seriously. You may not have nobody told you that, but it is. It's not written in law if you look on a woman and lust or in my, and lust, look at a lust that you already picked up. It's not the law of Moses. I didn't say covet. But look and lust after. You don't already commit adultery. Yeah, you covet, but you can commit adultery too, too, you say. Now that's beyond the law of Moses, his judgment. There is a greater power to live righteous. There is a greater power to think righteous. So there is a greater judgment. The judgment that will be judged for people who are under law. Oh, let me back up a little bit. Go back to the laws of good and evil. You need to understand these things. There's, there's a situation in the world today where they're just violence and murder. It's good to understand the purpose of law and the need of law. You in a country where people are just violent, got rulers that don't care, the same people, some people among the Arabs are the same people that are violent. Some people among the Africans in Africa are just violent. Some people in other countries among the Europeans, in some places, Germany, wherever, uh, Russia, some places, they're just violent, even though they're against their own people. Own colored people, I should say. And some against their own people. Go back to the Garden of Eden to Lost Green Eden. Now, Eve lusted for the fruit before she ever took of it. Now, you understand that children can be, sometimes children can be very cruel, low down. But knowledge we even had developing them, and they can say things really hurt each other, do things really hurt each other. Then you look at Eve at the tree. Before she ate of the tree of the knowledge of evil, you probably couldn't comprehend the thing that she could have done and that, that Adam could have done without the knowledge of evil. And you may not understand the benefit of this coming to them, though they were told not to. I mean, in regulating. Their action. Now, yeah, God spoke to their spirit and guided them, communed with them, and the body was just closed. But the extent of the evil of the capabilities, and with the serpent there to give an unction to it, to lust for the tree. To perceive it as something good, compared to what God is saying, 
and how greater he could have took into evil is something to consider. See, in other words, from coming to this point, it means something to have a constitution in yourself. If you not have a constitution in yourself, then this started with the knowledge of being evil. Standards and rules regulation yourself. When Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of being evil, they received the knowledge of right and wrong inside them. They became a law unto themselves. This made their nature become sinful by the law that was inside of them. Saying this is right and that's wrong. This law not only showed them right and wrong, but also worked death in them. Where there is no law, there is no sin. And the sting of sin is death. The nature became, their nature became sinful through the law that entered them, that they ate of knowledge in the form of a physical substance. You may find it hard to perceive, but if you get so old sometimes, or every experience being so weak, you can find the capability of reasoning a lot of things. Just due to body and not having sufficient nutrients of certain types. But the knowledge of good evil condemned Adam and Eve's flesh, and, and, but it also gave weight for them to have a constitution, though in sinful flesh, that dominated their spirit and didn't have the power to follow the knowledge of good evil. Yet it gave a standard. And they can walk out that standard to an extent. I'm just saying this to come back to you need a constitution in yourself. It's important to have standards, guidelines, principles in yourself. What kind of standard of a person you're going to be in right and wrong? Set your constitution ahead of time. Don't wait to start setting regulation for yourself when you, know, when, when you get to to a situation, you need to have standards set ahead of time. You need to have standards set in yourself. You need to have a constitution about yourself. You need to have a constitution in yourself. When you come to trials and tests, like when Job came to trials and tests, he already had a constitution. The law wasn't given to Moses. I mean, the law of Moses wasn't given. Abraham already had a constitution. In itself, you know, you got to settle some things yourself. You got to sit down sometime with your brain, man. Reason with your hearts, man. You got to commune with your heart upon your bed. You got to set some constitution. You got to establish. I'm going to walk in the way of right. I'm going to walk after the ways of God. Now, this is before the Holy Spirit was given. And I'm talking on things before the Holy Ghost. So acknowledge the good and the knowledge of good and evil. Knowledge good evil wasn't evil. That flesh was evil. Take a man laws, not evil. That's not why God did away with it. It's the flesh is evil. To know right from wrong is not evil. The flesh was evil. That's why he disobeyed God and ate of it when God told him not to. But the knowledge wasn't bad. Just because you, it wasn't supposed to eat of it doesn't mean it was bad. You know what I'm saying? That's not a contradiction. No, I don't. You just need to think a little further. That's why he gave you a brain. Think a little further. The Ten Commandment laws, the possible part of Romans are just and good and holy. But sin, that it might appear as sin, working death in me. It's the purpose of the law to show sin. God said that Adam and don't eat the tree, you, they eat the you were sure to die. Doesn't mean that the knowledge of good and evil was sinful or was evil or was bad, but it would kill them. That's what he told them. Because he knew their nature. So he warned them. It looked good. Nobody said it was bad. Nobody in the scripture. 
Você dá um liga, né? Diga, né? Desobedi, né? Bad. Don't mean no, don't mean bad. You have to go here. You just got to go to places beyond tradition. You have to think. There's nothing wrong with having a constitution and about yourself. This God perfectly put him in the garden. He knew they would eat of the tree. He put it there. He already planned. He made Satan. God did. The book of Isaiah says, I, Lord, create light, I create darkness. I create peace, I create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Ain't nothing happen on God. Man was going to come to eat up and God covered that. God did not intend to put man in the garden of Eden for to remain there and not know right from wrong like the birds or like the dog or the cat. He purposed that man should come to awareness that one day he would bring man further and further, even later give him the Ten Commandment laws to show a greater extent of the righteousness of his own self. And he could bring man later and be born into the family of Elohim as sons of Elohim. This was the plan from the creation day. Because Christ was a lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world, before he put the tree of God's good evil in the garden. Christ was already ordained slain. You need to get it. You need to understand purpose to bring to him sons of God, sons of Elohim. When you're born of the Holy Ghost, you are part of the family of Elohim. You need to catch that. God created man to be his son. So we are going to be no son of God, family. What, what does it mean to be a son of God? Not be a son of God. Because some of your preachers can't get it. That don't take away truth in the scripture of God's making. But it's good to have a constitution about yourself. Ten Commandment laws were added. Strengthen man's constitution. When one learned that had a knowledge of good and evil, those had the knowledge of good and evil, when God gave Moses the law, when they learned the law of Moses, the Ten Commandment laws became a part of their knowledge of right and wrong, and they preached in advance, like going from high school to college. Now here he says he will magnify the law and make an honorable talk about me. Elijah, the old Chesedit. You, you need to understand these things. That's a purpose of law in the land. It has a purpose. The purpose of law being in your side of you. You got to have a constitution about yourself. Rules and regulation of land. There's a land someplace where people don't have a law to their country, but there's what's called common law. Because God is instilled the knowledge of good evil in man, so just basic common sense. You don't mess with my wife, I don't mess with your 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 possession here and there, and that's common. Common law. Because all humans allow man to have that. So we know the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They have chores, don't tell them not to. Now there the law given to Israel was standards of right and wrong advanced beyond just the basic laws of evil, relationship with one another and with God. It's one thing to have a law that's given of Elohim that's governing to the land. Some refer to this as the as a theocracy, a law of the people of God. But when we come to the new covenant, where God puts this law in our inward parts, it is a spiritual, there's a spirit, it's like a theocracy and a democracy put together. People being born of the Holy Ghost within their nature. And it's God inside as the Spirit, being the Spirit. And it's man, the Spirit, being a part of his being. And everyone that's born of the Holy Spirit has this law in them that they'll follow. That, don't, that, don't, that does not exclude that you still have sin nature. But you have the power to control sin nature, just like Christ came and sent the flesh, like as we are, was tempted all points like as we are, yet without sin. We are in sinful flesh with Christ and birth in us. 
But we have to choose with our mind. You mean, we can either be spiritually minded, mindful of what the Holy Spirit says and the Holy Spirit desires. Or we can be fleshly minded, mindful of what our flesh says and what the flesh desires and lusts us to do. We have a free choice. We have the power to walk out of the Spirit, of the Spirit. But we still have a free choice to choose to walk out the flesh because the lust is still there. Paul explained in the seventh chapter of Romans of this nature. And he said in Romans chapter 7 as he explained this of the human nature. He wrote in verse um, starting verse um, in verse 14 he said for we know that the law is spiritual but I am carnal flesh physical so long as sin pertaining to the flesh he did not he's not saying he has to live in sin like some of your theologians teach you that is not what he is writing. We just got to recall it back in chapter 6. How can we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? He ain't turned around and contradict himself in this part of the same letter. In one paragraph, he writes this, and then the next paragraph, he will say he got to sin. No. Your theologians are just ignorant of what the apostle is saying. Paul said, I am carnal, talking about his physical flesh, but he's also spiritual. The law is spiritual, but I am carnal, so run the sin, explain the sin nature. That's why I couldn't keep the law in sinful flesh. But he gonna point it out in the with the Holy Spirit and birthed in him. So for we know that the law is verse 15 said, For that which I do, I allow not. Notice what it means wording. He showed in the flesh nuts against the spirit. And the law confirms the spirit doing right. Because the law just shows the righteousness of the Holy Spirit. Somewhat of the righteousness of the Holy Spirit. So, it's, so I say it shows of the righteousness of the Holy Spirit. So for that which I do, I allow not the flesh. That which he do with acts, good he do it. I allow not the flesh resisted. Now both is him. Spirit in him is him. The meaning of his man is him. He said that which I do act. He, he doing good. Now he don't have a split personality. Then he says I allow not. You cannot do something if you want to take it to the extent that you just say he said. You cannot do something and then not do something. Allow yourself to do something. It's contradiction. He's not saying that he's doing sin. He said that which I do, the good which he do, I allow not that his, his flesh resisted it. Next part of verse, that's an act. Next part of that which I would, that do I not. Now he goes from the act to the will choice. And he can show it in these tense. The flesh does against the spirit. That which I would, according to his will, I do not. That which he would choose to do, the flesh lusts against, resists. This, the flesh is still him. And it's still doing evil. In the matter of the choice, in the matter of the will. His will is to go evil. Um, you, you don't like it, I'm sorry. I'm just showing you the reality of the flesh. He just we wrote in the Bible for a reason. And when you get through writing this, you're going to make the point of showing with my flesh I serve sin, with my man I serve the Lord to say, hey, I can't take sin out of my flesh, but by the power of the Holy Spirit I control it and do right. You're not saying you're doing acts of sin like some of your theologians teach you who don't know God nor the scripture. The next part says, but that which I hate, that do I. May it come to the passion. Get it in clarity. In every tense, in acts, in will, and in his feelings, in his passion, the passion of the flesh, 
is against the passion of the spirit. This is, this is wisdom. So you have to control the flesh. He's showing that it's contrary to the spirit. Verse 16, he clarified doing good. He said, if I do that which I would not, I consent to law that is good. He clarified he was doing good because he laid the law. He said, if I do that which I would not, if he do what his flesh would not do, he still him, then I consent to law that I am doing good. Okay, so it's showing that he's talking about he's doing good. And the flesh is going to go wrong. Now you have to get this to understand scripture. He'll explain it again. Verse 17. Go back through it again. Now there is no more I that do it but sin that dwelt in me. In other words, Christ, he came in sinful flesh and he didn't live in sin. Flesh lusted. But he lived righteous and never, and never sinned in thoughts nor in acts. But he was, took on him the seed of Abraham, Mary's flesh and blood, tempted all points like as we are. He wasn't tempted from his flesh and he wasn't tempted all points like we are. Somebody said, well, he wasn't in sinful flesh. They were telling off one like they were. Are you a fool? Are you stupid? That's redundant. So if your theologian said that, that is redundant. You go make a fool out of yourself. You want to believe that some kind of way like that. You want to think like you can make go make a fool out of yourself. That's your business. Verse eighteen says, "For I know that in me that is in my flesh." Somebody can't get that. Somebody think, I'm not going to lose it. Oh, you know, your spirit inside of the flesh. You are a spirit. The flesh is just your house. But it has, a, you, you live inside of a eating, reasoning, thinking, walking, talking, feeling house. Ain't like the brick or the wood building you live in. But the natural house that you are clothed in is a living, feeling, Thinking, eating and drinking, desiring house that you live in. So you have to consider, but you a spirit. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelling no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Now in this, the apostle is showing, was showing the flesh lusting against the spirit. Now it's important to have Understand that the Holy Ghost giving this desire for righteousness. He put his law in our heart and our mind. We are born of the Spirit. And I started being saying that being among the children of God that follow his Spirit. You got rebels, those who do not. You got rebellious children. Just because you're born of the Holy Ghost for me, you're going to follow. Just because you're born of the Holy Ghost for me, you have faith in him. And he gave you the ability to live right, to stand with you, to teach you. That don't mean you have faith in him at all. You can have to be born the Holy Ghost and sit in the church somebody tell you you can't live right. You can't nobody live right. And the Holy Spirit won't heal no more. And, and God won't talk to you. The Spirit won't talk to you. You sit in the church and hear it with the Spirit in you. And somebody tell you that. And they tear down your faith in the Spirit. And you not believe he'll, he'll tell you nothing. You cannot believe he'll heal your body. Even though you're born of him. But you sit there and listen to somebody that tell you he can't get you to be able to live right. Don't expect to have faith in him. You sit there under somebody downgrading the power of the Holy Ghost, belittling him, and wonder why you don't have faith in him. That's your choice. You want to do that? You want to be? Mind you, say, I love these people. Well, that's your problem. You can either love God more than your mama, your daddy, your sister, your brother, and your life, and hear him, or you go to the people you love. You can start helping them people by hearing the word of God and standing on it. But you don't stick that, I love these folks, white folks, black folks, whatever it is. I love them, I ain't gonna be even denominating in church, just congregating you people. And you let them sit there and let them tell you. And you don't have faith in the Holy Spirit. God gonna tell you, you great that He gonna do anything that don't know. But the power is inside of God's people. To give them the ability to walk. As I said, a, this is like a theocracy and a democracy because when God put His law inside of us, the Holy Ghost He birth a seed child, the Holy Ghost inside of us. It's, it is a part of our being. 
We are literally the children of God. It is recorded in, in Romans chapter 8 as the apostle continued explaining. And he wrote in saying that we receive the Holy Ghost Christ our Father. Our spirit bears witness with the Holy Spirit that we are children of God. You see, we have our natural spirit. We born with spirit body dead. And then there's the Holy Spirit in birth in us. You know, we, we are two spirits. Everybody born of the Holy Ghost. We are a different kind of creature. Maybe you can't get this. Maybe some people can't believe you. But we have two spirits. We are Elohim, the Holy Ghost, the seed child of Elohim inside of us. And we have our natural spirit. You believe me. I have the spirit of Elijah and the Holy Ghost. And that's they're both the human spirit inside of you and the Holy Spirit. Are your spirits, your spirit. You're a different kind of creature. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. You are now a part of the Word of God, literally. Christ is the Word of inside you. Now, the Spirit in birth is inside you, being a part of your being, it affects your heart. Your heart and your mind, the reasoning of your heart and the reasoning of your mind. So when I said a theocracy and a democracy like in one, to those who walk out from the spirit, this law is a part of our being. It is God in us. Now, it's necessary for me to explain this that. For us born of the Spirit, you need to know that, let's see, you can have a child like Adam. Eve was taken out of his flesh and bone, but Eve had her own man. Holy Ghost, see, child is not like that in us. Adam begot children of Eve. Cain and Abel, they had their own man. Cain. Cain wouldn't kill Abel. It's not Adam's man. You can have children that resist you, want to over, run over daddy, run over mama, they got their own man. Don't think the Holy Ghost seed is like that. Are those supreme sons of God in heaven, those sons of God in heaven, the eternal sons of God, you can say in heaven, are like that because God has many sons. That's what, that's what the Bible says. Elohim, they'll be translate actually G-O-D-S to God and the most high God is God the Father. The reason most people don't accept that because people think men think that God has children he got to be like Zeus and his son because of your pain mythology. And he got to be like that. They don't realize that the seeds of the Holy Spirit, the children of God that nature is pure, righteous and holy. The Holy Ghost seed child in me and you has no desire to go against the Son or the Father. None whatsoever. Matter of fact, it longs to be exactly like the Son. It longs for the presence of the Father. It longs to be exactly like what? That's his desire, his passion, his pulsion. That's, that's the passion of his existence being. It's not like your seed. Don't, don't be confused now. You got to understand this. You have a choice of submitting to him and controlling your flesh. But this seed child of the Holy Ghost in birth is purely righteous. In so much that the seed child of the Holy Ghost in you is still called the Holy Ghost. And called Christ. Totally pure in righteous nature. It's not like your children. You know, now, Eve, now Eve didn't want to ask. She didn't bother to ask Adam by eating off the tree. She had an old man. Shinba, uh, Cain had his own man. Adam's flesh and blood, Eve's flesh and blood. They ain't like your children. You got to understand this. You got men trying to interpret God having sons like them having sons. And therefore, they, the sons of God will go against Elohim most high. No. That's man's ignorance. And you know, Europeans have that in their, theology, in their uh, mythology, I mean to say. Have that in their mythology. And so they reason God like that. You know, 
Elohim, I should say. They reason Elohim like that. That is a misconception. It's not like that. The power that is inverted in the true of Elohim has a power to do beyond anything that we can ask or think. It is purely righteous. You actually being birthed, have been birthed, those who are born the Holy Spirit are birthed into the family of God. So as many believe on the Messiah come to be the sons of God. Now the, the, the Holy Spirit will go back to the law to show you things of his righteous nature. You will understand. If you lead to him, he will lead and guide you all truth. He desires. He can't do it because so many people you are know, tied up and just following your theologian you with the school and learn it. We are so and so, Dr. So and so said this, and Dr. So and so said this, Dr. So and so said Dr. So and so, when you do doctor, you're a doctor said, you won't even hear the scripture. And the spirit can't tell you nothing. You'd be so confused and twisted up like most are. You can't hear the spirit. You only have faith in hearing the spirit. You just the world is just the world. And man is about this man. And you have no faith in yourself nor in any. Thing of God, of reality of God, when they get through the story, got to get so much partial truth, kind of like red pausing. Some of them get a whole lot of truth, then they put a little sand out in there. A little pause in the key. There's enough to kill you, though. Then you, where you don't walk spiritually. And theologians are good at that. You ought to know, you need to know this. You need to understand these things. In today, Christ said, I am the true man, and you're the branches. When you're born of the Holy Spirit, you're being born into the kingdom of heaven. You have a righteous nature in birth inside you. It is God's law in spirit form. Like the human flesh, there's a law of nature, it's like a law of grant. Whatever goes up must come back up. That's a law in nature. The law of the nature of the spirit is righteous. Not, he said, man, I'm not taking my law and just writing it on stones and putting it in a book, but I'm going to birth the law of my nature, the real law of my being inside me. You will be born of God. Through what Christ has done, his death, he took away the first. Died instead of mankind dying and redeeming all mankind. Went to hell. Instead of men going to hell and being burned, then they were already dead going to hell. Abraham and all came short and lost with evil. He redeemed all men came. He said, now all this madness, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. And he gave a new covenant to his testament. He gave his blood after his death, the throat of the sign of the Roman soldier spirit. The blood of his testament. And the covenant of his testament is the Holy Ghost. And when a person is born of the Holy Ghost, you're being born into the kingdom of heaven. Christ spoke of many parables on it. John said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He said, I baptize you with water, but he that cometh after me, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. You must be born of the water, a covenant, making a covenant and starting a new life, bearing an old man, and rising up to start a brand new life. When you're baptized in water, that's a covenant. They didn't just know I will show the inward feeling or inward decision. That is a covenant. You are covenanting. It's like putting a ring on, on Christ's finger. It's like a token of the way you are joining into Christ. You are covenanting to join into Christ. You are a very old man. That's what you're saying. That's your covenant. And you're doing it before a minister. Have him to initiate in doing it. You're burying the old man, so I'm no longer walk out my old lifestyle. I'm going to rise up walking out with the Holy Spirit with a brand new lifestyle. Born of the world, birthing into a new life. When Elohim sent the Holy Ghost, Christ is saying, with my spirit to the believer, I be way. You're now bone of my bone, flesh of my spirit, flesh. With my spirit, I be way. The baptisms on one, he go there too. Just like the many wings between a man and a woman, they are two rings, yet are they one, because they make the two one. You must be born of the water and of the spirit. The covenant God puts inside you. See, Adam didn't 
put a ring on Eve's finger, she was his flesh and bones. She was generated of him. So she was called woman. Meaning she was like a baby comes out of a woman's womb. She said, Adam said, This is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was generated out of man, a womb of man. When we're born the Holy Ghost, He puts His covenant inside of our nature. We are become a part of Him by receiving of His being, being born of Christ. You need to understand the truth and the power and the responsibility. We are walk as children of God. This is a great, I wanted to explain a lot of things deeper, but it is a great thing that we are coming to the day. The kingdom of heaven is coming. John said it was at hand. Now the kingdom of heaven has come inside of us. All who have been born of the Holy Ghost. Joy, the power to live righteous, and peace in the Holy Ghost. You will not receive the spirit of fear, but that of power, of love and of a sound man. You need to constantly hear someone preach to you like I preach in order for you to have faith in the Spirit. To walk in the power, you need to learn the power of the Spirit. You need to learn the goodness of God He's extended to man in order for you to have faith in God that He has actually extended this kind of goodness to you. You need to hear someone constantly proclaim and preach and explain the things that I'm explaining about the Holy Ghost and the power of the Holy Spirit. That's inverted in the born again believer or to be a birth of those who will accept the Messiah. You need to hear it for your faith to be strengthened in the Holy Ghost. Otherwise, no, you don't believe. No, you can't believe. You don't stand there and just say, I believe in you, I believe in you, I believe in you, I believe in you, I believe in you. No, no, no. You need to learn something. Jesus said, Take my, this is not a self sight thing. You need to learn about Christ. You need to learn about the power of the Holy Ghost. Look at what Christ has done in time past. Look at what the Holy Ghost has done. Learn about the love of Christ. Learn about the blood of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, the, 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 the power of the Holy Spirit to quicken the flesh even to, to rise. You need to learn these things that will increase your faith in the Holy Spirit. I mean, it's a lot to these things. But if you keep sitting around somebody telling you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, and you wonder why you don't believe that you can't, there is no mystery. There is rebellion. He that has an ear, let him hear the word of God. The Holy Ghost said, The day you hear my voice, harden not your heart, even in teaching you to hear the truth and not to hear error. Harden not your heart. Because he will lead and guide you into all truth. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for all your many blessings. Fulfill them which you have appointed and ordained to your glory and to the glory of your precious love, Holy Son. Raise up a pure and a holy bride unto your son, as you have ordained, as you were appointed for Elijah and Mary, Elijah. And Moses to do in these latter days. Prepare a holy bride unto your son of Israel and of the Gentiles, so be it, Father, fulfill your word. Father, fulfill your will and raise up a holy people unto yourself as you have ordained the point. Be glorified in our word. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your righteousness. We thank you for your wisdom. In King Yahshua's holy name we pray. And give you thanks and praise in his holy name. Amen. Amen.